Hi guys, today's video is to me one of the most shocking videos I have ever made. And so much has now come out about what has been going on in the Ocean Gate company. I don't even know where to start. So guys, I can tell you it's it's going to be a long one, but bear with me to, to the end because it's one shocking revelation after the other. And just to give you a quick insight about what's to come in this video, can you imagine the Titan Sup is underwater? Stockton Rush is having the game controller in his hand, steering around that submersible. And can you imagine the tourists on board screaming at him to give the game controller to his engineer? This has really happened at another dive, so we're getting into this later, but I have changed my mind about Stockton Rush significantly. Before I thought, yeah, he wanted to explore, blah, blah, blah. Yes, he ignored the warnings and he was very charismatic and that's why he was able to convince people to get down there. I was not aware how many warnings there were and what he did to circumvent regulations and laws and this is not has nothing to do with experimental or exploration this is in my opinion criminal criminal and attempted murder that is my opinion so that's why i'm saying i know this video is going to be long but if you're interested in that titan disaster and that it was a disaster in the making for many many years and what led up to it watch this video till the end i can't say more i'm i'm still shocked by my own video that i'm putting together so let's let's just dive in right away 41.73 degrees north 49.95 degrees west north atlantic ocean june 18th 2023 fate cleared up the weather blew off the fog and calmed the waves as the submersible titan and its five passengers dived through the surface waters and fell into another world they entered the deep ocean's uppermost layer known as the twilight zone passing creatures glimmering with bioluminescence, tiny fish with enormous teeth. Then they entered the midnight zone, where larger creatures ghost by like alien moons. Two miles down, they entered the abyssal zone, so named because it is the literal abyss. Deeper means heavier, pressures of 5,000, then 6,000 pounds per square inch. As it descended, the submersible was gripped in a tightening vice. Maybe they heard a noise then, maybe they heard an alarm. I hope they watched the abyss with awe through their viewport, because I'd like to think their last sights were magnificent ones. As the world now knows, Stockton Rush touted himself as a maverick, a disruptor, a breaker of rules. So far out on the visionary curve that, for him, safety regulations were mere suggestions. He said, if you're not breaking things, you're not innovating. He declared that at the 2022 GeekWire Summit. And he further said, if you're operating within a known environment, as most submersible manufacturers do, they do not break things. To me, the more stuff you've broken, the more innovative you've been. In a culture that has adopted the ridiculous mantra, move fast and break things, that type of arrogance can get a person far. But in the deep ocean, the price of admission is humility and it's non-negotiable. The abbess doesn't care if you went to Princeton or that your ancestors signed the Declaration of Independence. If you want to go down into her world, she sets the rules. And her rules are strict, befitting the gravitas of the realm. To descend into the ocean's abyssal zone, the waters from 10,000 to 20,000 feet, is a serious affair, 
And because of the annihilating pressures, far more challenging than rocketing into space, the subs that dive into this realm, and there aren't many, are tested and tested and tested. Every component is checked for flaws in a pressure chamber and checked again. And every step of this process is certified by an independent marine classification society. This assurance of safety is known as classing a sub. Deep sea submersibles are constructed of the strongest and most predictable materials as determined by the laws of physics. In the abyss, that means passengers typically sit inside a titanium or steel pressure hull forged into a perfect sphere. That is the only shape that distributes pressure symmetrically. That means adding crush-resistant syntactic foam around the sphere for buoyancy and protection to offset the weight of the titanium. That means redundancy upon redundancy with no single point of failure. It means a safety plan, a rescue plan, an acute situational awareness at all times. It means respect for the forces in the deep ocean, which Stockton Rush did not have. Unfortunately, on June 18th, 2023, wasn't the first time we have heard of Rush or his company Ocean Gate or his monstrosity of a sub. He and the Titan had been a topic of conversation talked about with real fear on many occasions by numerous people over the course of five years. A reporter that was writing the book The Underworld Journeys to the Depth of the Ocean describes her findings. She says, I heard discussions about the Titan as a tragedy in waiting on research ships, during deep sea expeditions, in submersible hangars, at marine science conferences. I had my own troubling encounter with Ocean Gate in 2018 and had been watching it with concern ever since. Everyone I met in the small, tight-knit world of men submersibles was aware of the Titan. Everyone watched in disbelief as Rush built a five-person cylindrical pressure hull out of filament wound carbon fiber, an unpredictable material that is known to fail suddenly and catastrophically under pressure. It was as though we were watching a horror movie unfold in slow motion, knowing that whatever happened next wouldn't be pretty. But like screaming at the screen, nothing that came out of anyone's mouth made any difference to the ending. In December 2015, two years before the Titan was built, Rush had lowered a one-third scale model of his 4,000 meter sub to B into a pressure chamber and watched it implode at 4,000 PSI, a pressure equivalent to only 2,740 meters. The test stated goal was to validate that the pressure vessel design is capable of withstanding an external pressure of 6,000 PSI, corresponding to a depth of about 4,200 meters. He might have changed course then, stood back for a moment and reconsidered, but he didn't. Instead, OceanGate issued a press release stating that the test had been a resounding success because it demonstrates that the benefits of Kyben fiber are real. So all of our test program has been about incremental testing. We started over two years ago with Cyclops 1, which allowed us to test our launch and recovery system, the, the launch platform, and a number of, of really important uh, operational and uh, electronic uh, processes, motor controls, things like that. Out here, we're, this is really focused on one thing, and that's the pressure vessel and making sure that that, that component, which is clearly the most critical component of the sub, uh, is uh, safe and capable of handling uh, depths down to 4,000 meters repeatedly with uh, people on board. Rush didn't even break stride. He ran right on ahead, plowing hard into his director of marine operations, David Lockridge. Lockridge had emigrated from Scotland to work for OceanGate, selling his home in Glasgow, moving to Washington State with his wife and seven-year-old daughter. 
Unlike many of his new colleagues, Lockridge was an established undersea pro, a submersible and remote operated vehicle pilot, a marine engineer, an underwater inspector for the oil and gas industry. He had piloted rescue subs for the British Navy to save men trapped aboard down military submarines. By January 2018, the Titan was nearly completed, soon to begin its sea trials. But first Lockridge, who according to his contract was responsible for ensuring the safety of all crew and clients during submersible and surface operation, would have to inspect the sub and pronounce it fit to dive. And that wasn't going to happen. Lockridge had been watching the sub's progress with ratcheting alarm. He'd argued with OceanGate's engineering director, Tony Nissen. OceanGate had responded by refusing to let Lockridge examine the work on the sub's oxygen system, computer system, acrylic viewport, O-rings, and the critical interfaces between its carbon fiber hull and titanium end caps. Mating materials with such wildly divergent pressure tolerances was also not advised. When Lockridge voiced his concerns, he was ignored. So he inspected the Titan as thoroughly as he could. Then he presented Rush and other Ocean Gate senior staff with a 10-page quality control inspection report that listed the sub's problems and the steps needed to correct them. Verbal communication of the key items I have addressed in my attached document have been dismissed on several occasions, Lockridge wrote on the first page. So I feel now I must make this report so there is an official record in place. These issues, he added, were significant in nature and must be addressed. Once Lockridge made up his mind, he was on a path from which there was no return. He once said the Titan could not get classed because it was built of the wrong material and it was built the wrong way. Lockridge listed more than two dozen items that required immediate attention. These included missing bolts and improperly secured batteries, components zip-tied to the outside of the sub, O-ring grooves were machined incorrectly, which could allow water ingress. Seals were loose. A highly flammable petroleum-based material lined the Titan's interior. Hosing looped around the sub's exterior, creating an entanglement risk, especially at a site like the wreck of the Titanic, where spars, pipes, and wires protrude everywhere. And we know that the two mere submersibles in the 1980s were caught stuck in one of those Titanic wires. Yet even those deficiencies paled in comparison to what Lockridge observed on the whole. The carbon fiber filament was visibly coming apart, riddled with air gaps, delaminations, and Swiss cheese holes, and there was no way to fix that short of tossing the hull in a dumpster. The manufacturing process for carbon fiber filament is exacting. Interwoven carbon fibers were wound around a cylinder and bonded with epoxy, then bagged in cellophane and cured in an oven for seven days. The goal is perfect consistency. Any mistakes are baked in permanently, given that the hull would be seeing such immense pressures not yet experienced on any known carbon hulled vehicle, we run the risk of potential interlaminar fatigue due to pressure cycling, Lockridge wrote, especially if we do have imperfections in the hull itself. The hull would need to be scanned with thermal imaging or ultrasound to reveal the extent of its flaws. Non-destructive inspection is required to be undertaken and subsequent results provided to myself prior to any in-water manned dives commencing, he added, digging in his heels on the scanning. This would reveal any weak spots and provide a baseline that could then be used to, to check for signs of fatigue after every dive. Scanning the hull shouldn't be a problem, should it? Lockridge noted in another document that OceanGate had previously stated the hull would be scanned. But spoiler alert, the hull was never scanned. 
The OceanGate engineering team does not plan to obtain a health scan and does not believe the same to be readily available or particularly effective in any event, the company's lawyer Thomas Gilman wrote in March 2018. Instead, OceanGate would rely on acoustic monitoring sensors on the Titan's hull that would emit an alarm when the carbon fiber filaments were audibly breaking. Well, when you're down 13,000 feet and you hear that alarm, that doesn't help you anything. Lockridge's report was concise and technical, compiled by someone who clearly knew what he was talking about. The kind of document that in most companies would get a person promoted. Rush's response was to fire Lockridge immediately, serve him and his wife with a lawsuit. Although his wife, Carol Lockridge, didn't even work at OceanGate or even in the submersible industry, they served him for breach of contract, fraud, unjust enrichment, and misappropriation of trade secrets. They threatened their immigration status, and they did seek to have them pay OceanGate's legal fees. In the lawsuit, OceanGate cited its grievances. According to the company, Lockridge had manufactured a reason to be fired. In 2016, he had mooned through the large viewing window Tony Nissen and other members of the OceanGate engineering staff through with whom he had been arguing. He had repeatedly refused to accept the veracity of information provided by the company's lead engineer and repeatedly stated he did not approve of OceanGate's research and development plans, insisting, for example, that the company should obtain a scan of the hull of Titan's experimental vessel prototype to detect potential flaws. Now unemployed, distressed by OceanGate's allegation and beset with legal bills, Lockridge was in a vulnerable position. He countersued for wrongful termination and sent his inspection report to the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration. OSHA, in turn, passed it to the Coast Guard. What happened after that? Obviously nothing. But what's so ironic in this? Before all these allegations, Lockridge had saved Rush from himself at least once before. In June 2016, Rush piloted OceanGate's shallow diving sub, the Cyclops 1, to the site of the Andrea Doria, a hulking 700-foot ocean liner and epic entanglement hazard that had sunk in 1956 off Nantucket in a patch of the Atlantic known for its murky fog and seething currents. The ship lies in 240 feet of turbid water, cobwebbed with discarded fishing lines. At a depth, it is accessible and just barely accessible to advanced scuba divers, 18 of whom have died there. Rush was headed down to capture sonar images of the shipwreck with Lockridge and three other clients. So the reporter further says, word gets around in the deep sea community. I learned of what happened next from two sub-pilots from other companies who both told me the same story on different occasions after hearing it from OceanGate personnel. I also reviewed correspondence related to OceanGate's lawsuit against Lockridge and his wife, in which Lockridge himself describes the incident. Lockridge declined to be interviewed. As chief pilot and the person responsible for operational safety, Lockridge had created a dive plan that included protocols for how to approach the wreck. Any entanglement hazards demand caution and vigilance. Touching down at least 50 meters away and surveying the site before coming any closer. But Rush disregarded these safety instructions. He landed too close, got tangled in the current, managed to wedge the sub beneath the Andrea Doria's crumbling bow and descended into a full-blown panic. Lockridge tried to take the helm, but Rush had refused to let him, melting down for over an hour until finally one of the clients shrieked, Give him the fucking controller! At which point Rush hurled the controller, a video game joystick, at Lockridge's head. Lockridge freed the sub in 15 minutes. 
The expedition had been planned to include 10 dives, but instead it ended abruptly with Ocean Gate sighting, adverse weather conditions. After returning to shore in Boston, Rush held a press conference. We were able to view the Andrea Doria area for nearly four hours, which is more than 10 minutes longer than scuba divers can, he announced. The dive, Ocean Gate's website noted, had focused on the bow of the vessel. Never did he mention any of the problems, that these four hours were anything but fun or scientific exploration. The reporter concludes, Writing this now, I feel a variety of emotions. Empathy, of course, for the families of those aboard the doomed Titan. Despair for the mission specialists whose trust in Ocean Gate was so misplaced. Shahazada Dawood, Suleiman Dawood, and Hamish Harding. Sadness because I knew and admired P.H. Nargolet, a deep sea icon whose expertise on the Titanic led to his fatal association with Rush. P.H. and I sailed together in the Pacific on the 2019 Five Deep Expedition when explorer Victor Vescovo piloted a revolutionary sub. She describes that she went on five deep sea expeditions with Nargole when Victor Vescovo piloted a revolutionary sub called the limiting factor to the deepest spots in all five of the earth ocean basins. Vescovo had commissioned the limiting factor in 2015 and hired Narjole as his technical advisor to vet the sub's design and build. Happily, Narjole didn't have much to do. The limiting factor was built by Triton Submarines, a company known for its high quality and smart designs, whose co-founder and president, Patrick Lahey, is regarded as the world's most experienced submersible pilot. Vescovo's sub was certified at great cost and difficulty over several years from inception to completion to sea trials to dives by senior inspection engineer Jonathan Struve from Det Norske Veritas, a Norway-based international marine classification society that is the gold standard for safety. And the reporter said, and my God, the testing. Every piece of the limiting factor was pressure tested to 20,000 PSI, equivalent to a depth of 43,000 feet, 20% greater than full ocean depth. There was so much testing that Triton built its own state-of-the-art pressure chambers in Barcelona, Spain. The only high-powered pressure chamber large enough to fit the passenger sphere was located in St. Petersburg, Russia. So the four-ton titanium orb was shipped halfway around the world. Four days, the sphere was squeezed mercilessly, simulating repeated dives to depth beyond any existing on Earth. Afterward, it showed zero evidence of fatigue. Even millions of cycles would not adversely affect it, Lahi told me. The crushing pressure only makes the sphere stronger. All this made Rush look awfully foolish within the community as he trash-talked the classification societies. He said, Bringing an outside entity up to speed on every innovation before it is put into real-world testing is an anathema to rapid innovation. He complained in a long blog post. His sub was simply too advanced for the uninitiated. But Rush also used slippery language to infer to clients that the Titan would be classed. He said, As an interim step in the path to classification, we are working with the premier classing agency to validate Titan's dive test plan. He actually had the DNV logo up on his website for a time. And that is disgusting because this agency has never tested or seen the sub. So they called Stockton and they said, take it down, take it down now. The reporter further says, 
I am angry at Rush's disrespect for the deep ocean, a realm he professed to want to explore, but in reality did not understand. I'm angry because five people are dead and many others were jeopardized, all of whom must feel like they've survived a game of Russian roulette after Rush was warned for years that his sub wasn't fit for purpose. My anger is also personal. Because when I first heard about Ocean Gate back in 2018, I was just beginning to learn about submersibles, just beginning to report my book. I didn't yet know how reckless, how heedless, how insane the Titan was. I didn't know that the 4,000 meter subs viewport was certified to only 1,300 meters. I wanted desperately to dive to abyssal depth, but at the time couldn't see a way to do it. The handful of vehicles in the world that can dive below 10,000 feet were all dedicated to science. Then suddenly there was Rush, holding forth in the media about how his brilliant new sub would take people to see the Titanic and saying things like, if three quarters of the planet is water, how come you can't access it? And he said, I want to change the way humanity regards the deep ocean. I wasn't very interested in diving to the gruesome Titanic, but I was extremely interested in diving to 13,000 feet. Rush's operation sounded like exactly what I was looking for. I called Ocean Gate and spoke to a marketing executive, a young person I won't name because they left the company long ago. The 2019 Titanic trips were nearly sold out, they told me, but there would be future expeditions even deeper. The end goal is not 4,000 meters. We're already building to go to 6,000 meters. This was possible because of Rush's many advanced innovations, they explained. The Titan's pressure hull would be made of space-grade carbon fiber, monitored by an array of acoustic sensors. They said steel just implodes. They said that with assurance, as if this was something that had ever happened. But carbon fiber gives a warning, 1,500 meters before implosion. It makes very specific snapping sounds. There's no other acoustic hull monitoring system in the world. True, no other deep sea submersible in the world had such a system because no other deep sea sub needed one. Fortunately, I knew enough to speak to a few people before I got anywhere near the Titan. One phone call was all it took. Terry Kirby, the veteran chief pilot of the University of Hawaii's two deep sea subs, the Piscus 4 and the Piscus 5, recoiled when I asked him what he thought about Ocean Gate. He said, be careful on that. That guy has the whole submersible community really concerned. He's just basically ignoring all the major engineering rules. He paused to make sure this had sunk in. And then he added, do not get into that sub. He is going to have a major accident. He referred me to a marine engineer, Will Conan, for a more detailed explanation of why the Titan was just a disaster. Conan is the chair of the Marine Technology Society's Manned Underwater Vehicles Committee. He helped write the class rules for submersibles and owned and operated a company that manufactured submersibles and had decades of experience in the field. And Conan, a straight-shooting French-Canadian, knew all about the Titan. He said, it's been a challenge to deal with Ocean Gate, with a sigh, and then launched into a two-hour explanation of the reasons why. Carbon fiber is great under tension, like stretching, but not compression, squeezing, he told me. He offered an example. You can use a rope to pull a car, but try pushing a car with a rope. The bottom line, a novel submersible design was welcome, but only if you were willing to do the Herculean amount of testing to prove that it was safe under the gimlet eye of a classification society. Oceangate decided that process would be too long and expensive, Conan said, and they were just going to do whatever they wanted. His committee had recently written a letter to Rush 
signed by Conan and 37 other industry leaders expressing their unanimous concern about the Titan's development and OceanGate's current experimental approach. Rush needed to stop pretending that he was working with DNV and start doing it. Stop misleading the public. Stop breaching an industry-wide professional code of conduct we all endeavor to uphold. The group concluded by asking Rush to confirm that OceanGate can see the future benefit of its investment in adhering to industry-accepted safety guidelines. The letter, which has now been widely publicized, was a stern warning. The epistolary equivalent of being hauled into the principal's office and smacked with a ruler. So surely people in the submersible world thought Rush would come to his senses. Surely he wouldn't actually go through with, it, with this, would he? But Rush ignored the Marine Technology Society's letter. He ignored the fact that it was signed at the top by Don Walsh. Don Walsh. If you know anything about the deep ocean, you know that when Don Walsh speaks, you shut up and listen. He doesn't tell the truth. What's his name? Rush. Walsh observed to me. He's absolutely 14 karat self-certitude. Have you met him, I ask? Oh, yes, Walsh said tartly. What was your impression? Walsh chuckled. Oh, he tolerated me. He was correct. He was polite. He really wanted to tell me how he was all out on the cutting edges of technology, places I couldn't even imagine. Rush ignored the fact that the letter was signed by the co-founder of IOS Expeditions, Rob McCullum, who he'd known since 2009 and had tried unsuccessfully to hire for OceanGate's Titanic operation. McCullum's client list was awash in wealthy ocean explorers. He'd led seven expeditions to the Titanic with Rush's two mere submersibles and had dived to the wreck himself. When McCallum learned more about the Titan, he wanted nothing to do with it. He said, I've never allowed myself to be associated with an unclassed vehicle ever. Rush ignored the fact that the letter was signed by Terry Kirby, a former Coast Guard navigator who led the Hawaii Undersea Research Lab for 38 years and had made more than 900 subdives in the Pacific. He said, you have enough to worry about if you're exploring volcanoes or shipwrecks without having to worry about whether your submersible is going to survive. Stockton Rush also ignored the fact that the letter was signed by Patrick Lahey, a man who forgot more about men's subs yesterday than Rush would learn in his lifetime. Lahi had not only signed the letter and warned Rush repeatedly about the Titan's dangers, he also quietly paid the Lockridge's legal fees in the hope that the inspection report would be dissected in court and made public. But to Lahi's bitter disappointment, Lockridge decided to settle, withdrawing his OSHA complaint and agreeing not to discuss OceanGate publicly in exchange for being left alone. I think Stockton had really intimidated him and frightened him, Lahi said. I certainly would have continued that fight because I believe you take something like that right to the end. But he didn't want to, and I knew it wasn't my decision, he said. By spring in 2018, it was evident that Russia's deep sea sub would never be certified. Titan could not get classed because it was built of the wrong material and it was built the wrong way, McCallum said. So once Stockton made up his mind, he was on a path from which there was no return. He could have stopped, but he could never fix it. Rush was angry that McCallum had been steering IOS clients away from diving in the Titan, though many had expressed interest. I have given everyone the same honest advice, which is that until a sub is classed, tested, and proven, it should not be used for commercial deep dive operations, McCallum wrote to Rush in March 2018. 4,000 meters down in the mid-Atlantic is not the kind of place you can cut corners. 
It is my hope that when you cite Ocean Gate's missing classification, that you also offer the following. Rush replied in a sour email. He said, one, that this need is expressly your opinion. Two, that there has never been a fatality in an unclassed sub. Three, that there are subs in current commercial operation that are not classed. Four, and that Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, and SpaceX all follow the same ethos and relevant and respective industry certification path. He concluded by lecturing McCullum, industry attempts to disparage innovative business, operational and design approaches will not help advance subsea exploration. At various conferences, experts talked about the Titan and they said, for example, the Titan's or Russia's carbon fiber hull, it's like if you stand on an empty soda can. Or they said, I wouldn't get into that thing for any amount of money. And clearly, Rush would do as he pleased. He would register the Titan in the Bahamas and sail from a Canadian port into international waters, thus skirting Coast Guard regulations that any commercial sub must be classed. Ocean Gate's lawyer Thomas Gilman emphasized in the 2018 lawsuit against the Lockridge's that the Titan will operate exclusively outside the territorial waters of the United States. And another trick that Rush used. He wasn't carrying paying customers. He was enlisting mission specialists. This wasn't some cute marketing ploy like American Airlines giving a kid a set of plastic pilot's wings. In maritime law, crew receive much lighter protections than commercial passengers. And to Russia's mind, calling them mission specialists and putting them to work on the ship made them crew. On a podcast, CBS reporter David Polk noted that in advance of shooting his segment on the 2022 Titanic expedition, Oceangate had emailed him a document that basically said, in thy news reporting, thou shalt not use the terms tourists, customers, or passengers. The term is mission specialists. So yes, we can say that many people felt that a catastrophe was brewing with the Titan, but at the same time, everybody's hands were tied. So in my interpretation, he clearly did that to give the passengers less legal protection. And I'm really wondering if the tourists that went with him were aware of that. Yes, they had to sign the waiver, but were they clearly aware of that trick? In April 2019, the Titan conducted a second deep test dive, an attempt to reach 4,000 meters in the Bahamas. The sub protested with such blood-curdling cracking and gunshot noises that its descent was halted at 3,760 meters. Rush was the pilot and he had taken three passengers on this highly risky plunge. One of them was Carl Stanley, a seasoned submersible pilot who would later describe the noises as the hull yelling at you. Stanley was no stranger to risk. He had built his own experimental unclassed sub and operated it in Honduras. But even he was so rattled by the dive that he wrote several emails to Rush urging him to postpone the Titan's commercial debut less than two months away. Stanley believed that the carbon fiber was breaking down. He said, I think that hull has a defect near that flange that will only get worse. The only question in my mind is, will it fail catastrophically or not? He advised Rush to step back and conduct 50 unmanned test dives before any other humans got into the sub. True to form, Rush dismissed the advice. One experimental data point is not sufficient to determine the integrity of the hull, he told Stanley, and he told him, keep your opinions to yourself. Stanley further said, I remember him saying at one point to me that one of the reasons why he had me on that dive was he expected that I would be able to keep my mouth shut about anything that was of a sensitive nature. The reporter asked him, like what? And he said, I don't think he wanted everybody knowing about the cracking sounds. 
Shortly after that, Rush did make an accommodation to reality. He sent out a press release heralding the Titan's history-making deep sea dive to 3,760 meters with four crew members, and then a month later canceled the 2019 Titanic expedition. He had previously scrubbed the 2018 expedition, claiming that the Titan had been hit by lightning. Now Rush was off to build a new hull. Surely, people in the submersible world thought Rush would come to his senses. Surely he wouldn't actually go through with this. But he did. 2020 was a write-off because of COVID. In 2021, Rush took his first group of mission specialists to the Titanic. And with him now, as part of his team, was P.H. Narjolet. It's not that Nargelay's friends didn't try to stop him. They said, oh, we all tried. I tried so hard to tell him not to go out there. I fucking begged him, don't go out there, man, Lahi said. It's that Nargelay knew everything they were saying was true and wanted to go anyway. Maybe it's better with him out there, Lahi recalls Nargelay saying. I can help them from doing something stupid or people getting hurt. In the implosion's aftermath, the French newspaper Le Figaro would report that Nargelet had told his family that he was wary of the Titan's carbon fiber hull and its oversized viewport, assessing them as potential weak spots. He was a little skeptical about this new technology, but also intrigued by the idea of piloting something new, a colleague of Nargelet's marine archaeologist Michael Lore explained to a newspaper. It was difficult for him to consider a mission on the Titanic without participating in it himself. Now the reports are emerging about the plague of problems on the Ocean Gate's 2021 and 2022 Titanic expeditions. More dives scrubbed or aborted than completed, for an assortment of reasons from major to minor. A communications system that never much worked. Battery problems, electrical problems, sonar problems, navigation problems, a thruster installed backwards, ballast weights that wouldn't release. On one dive, Rush instructed the Titan's occupants to rock the sub back and forth at abyssal depth in an attempt to dislodge the sewer pipes he used to achieve negative buoyancy. Getting all the way down to the seafloor and then fumbling around for hours trying to find the wreck, Lahi said in 2022, I mean, how do you not find a 50,000 ton ship? One group had been trapped inside the sub for 27 hours, stuck on the bulky launch and recovery platform. Other so-called mission specialists were sealed inside the sub for up to five hours before it launched, sweltering in sauna-like conditions. Arthur Leubel, a German businessman who dove in 2021, described it to the Associated Press as a kamikaze operation. Fair is fair. Some people did get to see the Titanic and live to tell about it. Plenty more left disappointed having spent an extremely expensive week in their branded Ocean Gate clothing, doing chores on an industrial ship. Ocean Gate's Titanic Expedition 2023 promotional video, now removed from the internet, showed mission specialists wiping down ballast pipes and cleaning the sub. And when Rush offered them 300-foot consolation dives in the harbor, even those were often canceled or aborted. Sadly, those problems now seem quaint. When the world learned of the Titan's disappearance on June 18th, no one I know in deep sea circles believed that it was simply lost, floating somewhere, unseen because the mind reels, it didn't have an emergency beacon. No one believed that its passengers were slowly running out of oxygen. If the sub were entangled amid the Titanic wreck, that wouldn't explain why its tracking and communication signals had vanished simultaneously at 3,347 meters. The fear was collapse, Lahi said bluntly. The fear was always pressure hull failure with that craft.
But the families didn't know, and the public didn't know, and it would be ghastly not to hope for some slim chance of survival, some possible miracle. But which was better to hope for? That they perished in an implosion at supersonic speed, or that they were alive with hardly a chance of being found, left to suffocate for four days in a sub that had all the comforts of an MRI machine? Kirby told the reporter, "When I found out that they were bolted in, they couldn't even evacuate and af- and fire a flare. You know, there's a really good reason for those hatch towers. It gives everyone a chance to make it out. The lack of the hatch in the Ocean Gate design was a serious deviation from any and all submersible design safety guidelines that exist today." Conan wrote in an email. Seconding Kirby, all subs need to have hatches, so the Titan didn't have one. Very, very fatal. No knowledge of the tragedy was preparation enough for watching television coverage of the Titans and trails being craned off the recovery ship Horizon Arctic. Eight-inch-thick titanium bonding rings bent. Snarls of cables, mangled debris. Shared metal, torn exterior panels. They seem to have been wrenched from Grendel's claws in some mythical undersea battle. But no, it was simply math, a cold equation showing what the pressure of six thousand psi does to an object unprepared to meet it. One person involved in the recovery effort, who wishes to remain anonymous, told the reporter that the wreckage itself was proof that no one aboard the sub had suffered. From what I saw of all the remaining bits and pieces, it was so violent and so fast. Reporter asked, "What did the carbon fiber look like?" There was no piece I saw anywhere that had its original five inch thickness. He said, "Just shards and bits. It was truly catastrophic. It was shredded." Now back on land, he was still processing what he had seen. He said, "I think people don't actually understand just how forceful the ocean is. They think of the ocean as going to the beach and sticking their toes in the sand and watching waves come in and stuff like that. They haven't a clue." Is there any possible reason the Titan could have imploded other than its design and construction were unsuitable for diving to 4,000 meters? The reporter asked Jarl Stroma, the manager of class and regulatory compliance for Triton submarines. Stroma, who has worked in the industry since 1987, began his career as a senior engineer at the American Bureau of Shipping. He is an expert on the rules, codes, and standards for every type of manned sub, the nuts and bolts of undersea safety. He replied flatly, "No." OceanGate bears full responsibility for the design, fabrication, testing, inspection, operation, maintenance. Catastrophic failure of the Titan submersible and the death of all five people on board. It wasn't supposed to be this way. In the beginning, OceanGate's mission had seemed so promising. Founded in Everett, Washington, in 2009, the company provides manned submersible services to reach ocean depths previously unavailable to most individuals and organizations. But there is a vast chasm between intention and execution, and pieces of the Titan now lie at the bottom of it. After the tragedy, OceanGate went dark, suspending its operation. Its website and social media channels were suddenly gone. Its promotional videos deleted. Emails sent to the company received this reply: "Thank you for reaching out. OceanGate is unable to provide any additional information at this time." Phone calls were greeted with a di- disconnection notice. Only one person familiar with Ocean Gate's thinking would speak to the reporter on the record, Guillermo Sönlein, who co-founded the company with Rush, and Sönlein left that post in 2013. So he said, "So I don't have any direct knowledge or experience with the development of the Titan. I've never dived in Titan. I've never been on the Titan Titanic expedition." 
All I know is I know Stockton and I know the founding of Ocean Gate and I know how we operated for the first few years. So then the reporter said, okay, then what should people know about Rush? So he said, I think he did see himself in the same vein as these disruptive innovators, like Thomas Edison or any of these guys who just found a way of pushing humanity forward for the good of humanity, not necessarily for himself. He didn't need the money. He certainly didn't need to work and spend hundreds of hours on Ocean Gate. You know, he was doing this to help humanity. At least that's what I think was personally driving him. Before the Titan's last descent, there hadn't been a fatal accident in a human-occupied submersible for nearly 50 years. Despite a 2,000% increase in the annual number of dives in that period, in the 93-year history of manned deep-sea exploration, no submersible had ever imploded. Conan told the reporter, ultimately it comes down to not just technology, but the rigor of the nerdy, detailed engineering that goes behind it to determine that things are predictable. This disaster validates the approach the industry has always taken, McCallum said. Stockton could have held in check by professionally engineers, independent oversight and a genuine culture of safety, that he wasn't will be the subject of much investigation. For those within Ocean Gate that enabled this culture, there should be a long period of self-reflection. This tragedy was predicted. It was avoidable. It was inevitable. It must never be allowed to happen again. Those rules Rush so disdained. They had been refined, owned, universally adopted, and they had worked. Submersibles had earned their title as the world's least risky mode of transportation, even as they operated in the world's riskiest environment. Because there is one last rule that every deep sea explorer knows. The goal is not to dive. The goal is to dive and come back. So guys, I don't know how you feel after all that you've just heard and seen. So my heart goes out to all the family members of the victims and may they rest in peace. I don't want to say anything else and uh, time will tell if there's any members of Ocean Gate that can be held responsible as well. Or was it just stalked and rushed? I can't even say it was his immense ego. It, it was more. It, it, I can't even put it in words, guys. Um, I can say thanks for watching. And if you're interested in the Titan topic, um, there's other videos that I have made that help explain things. Check out... The link in the description and check out my channel and subscribe for more um i have more in the works regarding the titan um but also other stuff and thanks for watching guys if you can leave this video a like to support my channel and i hope to see you soon in one of my other videos thank you so much bye bye